Oh, don't baby bat. Can I have my dress? I'm gonna need that for this video. Hello and welcome to Costume Symposium. The costume community put together a lot of really informative and educational videos for this weekend, so I hope that you're able to check some of them out. I'm branching out a little bit for my video contribution. I normally make pretty aesthetic sewing montage kind of videos that are kind of chill and relaxing, but those are more showing off my projects than really educational. So I thought for this video I'd do a breakdown of the couture elements and construction of the famous strawberry dress. However, if you're more into the like ASMR style of videos and like chill videos than really info dump videos, then please check out the other videos on my channel. That's kind of more of what I usually do. <laughs> so if you're unfamiliar, Lyrica Matoshi's strawberry dress became really emblematic of the cottagecore fashion as the whole world shut down last year and everyone kind of dreamed of moving to the countryside where they didn't have to deal with this. <laughs> I'm a year late to the trend, but I'm still really obsessed with this dress. I thought it would be fun to analyze the couture elements and construction of this dress and break down why the dress retails at $500 and whether or not this dress is worth the high price tag. For qualifications, I received my master's degree in costume production a few months into all of the lockdowns, so you know, I thought why not put my degree to good use because it's not getting any use anywhere else. <laughs> so to start with, the strawberry dress is absolutely worth the price if you're just looking at labor costs alone. If you're tired of the ethics and labor debate regarding fashion, then I've sectioned this video up so you can skip this part if you want, but I do really think it's an important thing to consider when buying everything, really, but especially with considering luxury, luxury garments. <laughs> So sewing is absolutely 100% a skilled craft and making clothes takes a lot longer than the average consumer expects, especially on a garment with this level of finishing. Say a professional maker is paid $20 an hour, which honestly should be really the absolute minimum. That would give them 25 hours to complete this project from cutting to finishing. And that's not even including the cost for overhead, for materials, for the design process, and like nothing else. Now, maybe it wouldn't take an experienced maker that long to make this dress, especially if it's being made in batches. But my ultimate point is that if you really like something enough to purchase it, then you should be willing to purchase it at a price that compensates the creator fairly. I have so many more opinions on this topic, but that's not really what this video is about. So let's move on to the construction of this super beautiful dress. <laughs> this strawberry dress is made out of polyamide tulle and PVC glitter and glue, and that's pretty much it. At first I thought that the strawberry glitter tool was custom made um, because I thought that the inner and outer layers were the same color, but upon closer inspection, it looks like the strawberry glitter tool and like a couple of the layers uh, closest to the outside are a lighter pink color and more of a diamond knit, while the inner tool is kind of a darker pink and seems to be more of a bobinette tool. Before I get really into the construction of this garment, I wanted to point out some surface details that really set couture garments apart from fast fashion. First off, there are no overlocked seams in this entire garment. Overlocking is the same thing as serging. Serging is just a brand name, so I tend to refer to it as overlocking. Apart from the skirt seams, every seam is bound by tool, including the zipper. Fast fashion also frequently forgoes structural elements that might help with the garment's longevity. So for example, on the strawberry dress, there are some puffs of tulle on the shoulders and that keeps the sleeve puffed out over time rather than letting it sink in. <laughs> Understitching is also a detail found in a lot of couture garments that is frequently skipped in fast fashion, which is something that I will explain later. <laughs> um, and then finally, extraneous stitches like gathering stitches or basting stitches are usually left in garments for fast fashion, which can then affect the like stretch of a garment and are really just not that pretty when they're left in. So those are the things I've noticed on this dress just from a quick glance. Aside from that, the construction on this garment is actually pretty complex even though it looks fairly simple because they've encased every single seam on this garment. So let's talk about that now. This is going to be really long and technical so I hope that it's not too boring. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments. I would love to clarify anything that gets a little bit too uh, convoluted, um, but it is a really complicated garment and it's a lot of complex uh, kind of seaming and order of construction. So just bear with me. It's I found it very interesting. I think this is a really, really niche thing inside of an already niche kind of community. Um, but if you're interested in the more complex construction of couture garments, then this video is for you. I don't baby bat. Can I have my dress? I'm gonna need that for this video. Is that okay? I see. Okay. What if I give you something else to lay on? Okay. You get this, and I get the dress back. 
Does it sound like a good trade? Let's start with the skirt construction since it's a little more straightforward. There's so much fabric in this skirt. I really think that this is what sets the original dress apart from all of the recreations. Whenever I see someone else make it or a knockoff being sold, it really strikes me how they always seem to skimp on the volume of the skirt. The skirt has six layers of tulle, the glitter outer layer, three lighter pink layers, and two darker pink layers. The three lighter pink layers are stitched as one layer on the center back seam, same with the two darker pink layers. The two innermost skirt layers are a half circle with outgathers, and the four outer layers look to be a full circle that's gathered at the waist. The outermost glitter layer has a strip of plain tulle gathered to the hem for the ruffle. The hems of each layer and the seam for the ruffle isn't finished in any way, it's just cut, but that's pretty standard for tulle skirts with lots of volumes, since it won't get much wear in that spot, since it's so loose and any extra seam or hem finishing will make the hems too wiry rather than soft and flowy, if that makes sense. There seems to be only one seam in each set of layers in the very center back as a continuation of the zipper. But these center back seams are also left raw for the same reason. So where the ruffle is attached is one of the few places that I saw any kind of flaw in the sewing. In one section, the stitcher caught a bubble of the skirt fabric while stitching the ruffle on. It's not a huge deal in a skirt that has so much fabric and movement, and it's definitely an easy mistake to make. But at this price point, I kind of expect the stitching to be pretty flawless, and if I had been the maker, I would have unpicked it and redone it in this section. Moving on to the bodice, the bodice is a lot more complicated than the skirt. It also has a ton of layers, and each seam is encased similarly to how sheer bras are constructed. The back panels and the sleeves each have one layer of the darker pink tulle, two layers of the plain lighter pink tulle, and one layer of glitter tulle. So I can tell that there's only one layer of the dark pink tulle because I can just pick up this one layer, and the layer directly beneath it is a lighter pink, so there is only one layer of this dark pink tool. There is also obviously only one layer of the strawberry tool on the back panels, um, because you can only see one layer of strawberry. By just kind of like feeling it and trying to pull apart all the layers, I can tell that there are two other layers under this. Between the glitter mesh and the darker pink tool, and they're not the dark pink tool, so I know they have to be two layers of the light pink tool. For the back panels and the sleeves, it does look like they have flatlined the three outer layers together and then bagged that out with the dark pink tool, but I can't tell 100% without taking it apart. For anyone who isn't familiar, the term bagging out a seam just means that you stitch it right sides together and then flip it, while flatlining is stitching two layers right side to wrong side. The front panels have an extra layer of glitter tool. As you can see that there's strawberries that are kind of shadowed and less bright than the ones on the outer layer. So there's an outer layer of glitter tool, and then the layer directly beneath this glitter tool is just a plain layer. So if I pull this up, you kind of see that the glitter strawberries that are inside there are still like not coming up with this. So there's a layer of glitter tool, and then a layer of the plain light pink tool, another layer of glitter tool, and then I believe another layer of the light pink tool between the dark pink tool layer and the second glitter layer. <laughs> it sounds complicated, but it's not too bad. There's just a lot of layers to account for. So the two outermost layers, this one is obviously gathered, and then the one directly beneath it is also gathered. You can kind of see that there are two layers of ruffling here. The three innermost layers have a vertical bust dart, and all three layers were stitched into one dart. It looks like the flat lining darts and gathering seems to have come after the neckline and shoulders were stitched, just because the only layer on this side of this ruffle is the dark pink tool and everything else is on this side of the ruffle, which means that they had to have been separate when they were flipped around. So I think how this was put together was first, the lighter pink layers on each the front and back were flat lined at the shoulder seam. Um, and that secures the gathers to a flat layer. And then on both the now flat lined lighter pink layers and the inner dark pink layers that are alone, um, those were seamed together at the shoulder seams separately. Next, with the right and left sides of the bodice still separate, the neckline from center front all the way to center back, where the zipper meets, was finished by bagging out the dark pink layer and the light pink layers right sides together and sandwiching the ruffle between those two different shades of pink. 
before turning the bodice right sides out, I believe the center front was stitched. Then everything got flipped right sides out and understitched so that the seam allowances would stay with the inner bodice layer rather than letting the seam and ruffle roll out kind of this way. Um, and to understitch, you can see that it only goes through this darker lining layer and the seam allowances. It doesn't travel all the way through to the front. So you stitch it when it's still kind of like this. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> At this point, the center, back, and side seams are still unfinished, so we still have access to the inside of the dress through this hole and then through this hole here. I think it only makes sense that the darts and gathering came next since those are gonna get more difficult the more everything else gets stitched up. So the innermost three layers were darted together and then the gathered layers were tacked to the darted layers with a basting stitch. I specify a basting stitch because it seems like that stitch is no longer there. You can see the two stitching lines where they attached the bust ties, but you can't see any gathering stitches or stay stitching to keep the gathers in place. So now that the gathering and the darting is done, the bodice fronts are completed. So next they probably stay stitched along the side seam just because it makes life a lot easier. When I mentioned earlier that there's similarities to bra construction, this is what I meant. When making sheer garments, you don't want any raw edges close to the skin because even though tulle doesn't unravel, it's super itchy and unpleasant. Um, it's much more comfortable to encase all the seams and it looks a lot nicer too. This next bit is a little hard to maneuver, but definitely not impossible. So the back layers are still separate along the side seams, the waist seam, and along the zipper. So the only places they're stitched permanently at this point is at the shoulder seam and along the neckline. To encase this side seam here, basically what's done is that this would be flipped over so that right sides are together on both the front side and on the back side. This gets stitched along your seam allowance. When you flip both back parts together, they are now facing wrong sides together and they're covering up the seam allowance. This keeps all the raw edges really nicely hidden and facing towards the back of the garment. So usually if all of your seam allowances are facing towards the back of the garment rather than flat, that's how you can tell that it's been done in this way. The sleeves are also a bit of maneuvering, but they're the last big part of the bodice. The inner sleeve seams were stitched in two separate layers. So you have the darker pink lining and all of the outer layers of lighter tulle. And you can tell that because I can just separate it and all the seams are hidden. These are then stitched and bagged out at the hem edge with the ruffle sandwiched in between. The elastic is pretty straightforward. After everything's turned right side out, you just stitch an elastic channel, like a presser foot away from the seam, then thread an elastic through it and then close up the rest of the hole. Okay, so the sleeve ruffles don't have any seam. They're left with a cut edge on both ends and overlapped by about two inches. That makes it so that there isn't a gap ever. Like if you were to butt them and then not seam them, then there would be a gap. This actually looks a lot nicer than having a seam or a gap. So I do really like how they overlap the ruffle. I think that is a much nicer finish than the seam or having a gap there. However, the tool isn't really like the most precisely cut. There's a couple nicks. It seems like they niche the ruffle a bit when cutting the strip or maybe when they were trimming the seam allowance. Again, it's not really a big deal, especially with so much ruffling in fabric and probably not something a casual observer would ever notice, but I'm like really getting up in this dress's business. So this one thing I probably wouldn't do over just because the effort of unstitching everything and then making a new ruffle and re-sewing the sleeve, it's just not worth it for a little tiny nick of tulle when there's so much to cover it. The sleeves were stitched into the bodice arms eye, just like normal sleeves, nothing too fancy there. However, they did insert a ruffle at the top to keep the sleeve from deflating and like giving it some loft at the shoulder seam. They also gathered a bit on the sleeve cap. The arms eye seam itself is bound kind of like how you'd bind something with bias taped. It was stitched first on the bodice side with like right sides together, wrapped around, and then stitched again, uh, I guess kind of in the ditch. You can see where there's that little excess that they caught here and the stitching is very precise on the bodice side. We are almost done. The bodice is basically done at this point. All that's left is attaching the skirt to the bodice, inserting the zipper and attaching the bust ties. I guess waist tie and bust tie. <laughs> I think before the skirt and bodice are attached, the center back of each panel was flatlined because that's just easier to deal with when you have so many layers. The next part is a little bit weird, but it seems to have worked out really well without creating the need for extra binding like they did in the arms eye schemes. So what you're looking at here is an encased seam in between the dark 
dark pink lining layer of the skirt and the lighter pink like fashion layers of the skirt. So I think first they flatlined all of the skirt layers together at the waist to make it more manageable. Then they just stitched the bodice to the skirt as though it was just like a normal skirt and bodice without any kind of lining at all. Right sides together with the hanging loops attached at this point. The hanging loops are obviously on the very inside of the dress and not between these two layers. That's why I think that they were stitched together at this point. Then next is the weird part. It seems like they took only the two darker layers. If it was just stitched together normally like this, this would be a raw edge sticking out. So I think what happened next was that they pulled it over and wrapped it around the seam allowance, like wrapped it around the raw edges of the seam allowance at the waist and then pulled it really tight against those seam allowances and stitched just outside the first pass of the waist seam. So you can see where it was attached here and like rolled back. And then you can see another line of stitching here where they secured the two darker pink layers up essentially. This is unfortunately another place where the stitcher seems to have caught some of the outer layers and caused some unnecessary bubbling. Again, if it were me, I might unpick it and redo it, but it's not noticeable at all when it's worn or literally at all. It's just because I'm aggressively staring at it. Uh, then again, I might just decide it's not worth it depending on my mood. So doing the waist seam in this way binds the seam really nicely and also makes it so that the inner layers will definitely be shorter than the outer layers. I believe they were also just cut a bit shorter, but if you'd forgotten to cut your layers shorter, this would ensure that the inner layers wouldn't show on the outside of your skirt. Plus having shorter layers inside always makes for a fluffier skirt. To finish the skirt, the waist seam allowance was tacked down to the inner skirt layers at various places. The zipper seems to have just been top applied rather than sandwiched between the bodice layers because the zipper tape is bound by net. Actually, I think they trimmed the zipper tape away um, because it's not very stiff like a normal zipper would be. Either way, bound zippers are a lot prettier than zipper tape, so I appreciate the detail even if it was done because it's just easier. <laughs> the very last detail is the waist and the bust ties, and literally those are just tubes of fabric top applied with an edge stitch on either side of the tube. The tie ends are left raw, which honestly is preferable because one, it's tool, it's not gonna fright anyways, and two, stitch ends can end up looking really chunky on ties. Wait, sorry, so the ties obviously came before the zipper because there's no raw edges at the back of the tie, only at the front. Hey, yo! Can you say hi? Mm -hmm. You don't want to say hello. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so that's it. That's all of the construction. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of complicated couture finishing. Like all of the mount seams take time, all of the darting and gathering takes time. Finishing the seams like they're a bra is super easy and quick on a bra, less so when you're kind of having to maneuver and like contort yourself into the bodice, right? Like it's all flipped in weird. So like that all takes time. Uh, everything on this dress takes more time than you think it would. It's much more complicated garment than you think it'd be. So that's kind of the moral of this video. The strawberry dress looks like a really cute, really simple dress but it turns out to be really complicated when you break down each construction element. Not to mention that cutting tool is a huge pain in the ass and the makers in this studio are absolutely gonna be dealing with glitter fallout until they die. <laughs> so even with some of the flawed sewing I would still 100% say that the strawberry dress is worth the price and while my wallet does not love to do this I'm really happy that I have it and can reference a couture garment now when I am looking at things to make. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you're enjoying Costume Symposium. I know this one was long and kind of dry so hopefully I didn't scare too many people away. <laughs> I usually do more aesthetic sewing ASMR style stuff with some like tips and tricks slipped in there. So if you're more into that video you might like my other videos more. Mm, probably. They're definitely a little bit more accessible to the average viewer than this video so I acknowledge that and go check those out. <laughs> Anyways, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and check out my other videos. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you are super confused and want me to explain some more stuff, you hated this video, <laughs> you liked this video, then leave a comment. I love to talk to everybody. Um, and if you want to see more sewing videos, I document all of my projects in like the b-roll pretty style. So if you like that, then please subscribe. Um, I also do some vlog style stuff occasionally, um, but I'm more on the sewing end of videos. So. Anyways, uh, I hope to see you soon next week, right? Uh, we're finally getting back to Alice, so that's super exciting. I'm literally so hyped for this, so come join me there. Okay, I'll see you guys next week. Bye!